Now, according to Austrian economic theory is that interest rates are vital to give uh, information to the investor and the businessman, the entrepreneur, to decide what to do. And, and this is another fallacy in the system, and I try to get after them as much as I can because people say, well, see, this is another, another time capitalism has failed. And that, of course, is, came out of the Depression. They said in the 20s, the gold standard in capitalism failed. But the real problem is that when the Fed lowers interest rates, they create money. We don't have any savings. Savings are supposed to tell you when to invest. If there are no savings, interest rates should be very high. And then the businessman backs off and the consumer backs off. The consumer says, oh, interest rates are high. I'm going to save more money. And uh, in that there is a natural cycle there. But when the Fed comes in and when interest rates in the market should be 8% and they make them 1%, there's a disillusionment. Everybody thinks, oh, there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of savings out there and, and we have to get busy. Then, then the, the so-called malinvestment comes in. The builders say everybody can have a house and, uh, so they overbuild their houses and then our housing programs insist that we make these bad loans. But there's enough bad loans just from the artificially low interest rates. And, uh, and then it feeds on itself and the houses, uh, because of the inflationary impact, the prices of these houses go up, and people feel very, very rich. One time, Alan Greenspan argued with me before the committee about, uh, you know, whether or not we had capital or not and uh, where this was coming from. And he says, well, it comes from the value of the house going up. And I told him flat out, I says, I think you're confused on what is debt and what is real capital. But he called that savings and capital because the nominal – the amount of dollars of the house is going up. But, but if that were the case, it shouldn't dissipate so quickly. You know, a real capital wouldn't disappear that way. So the house is down. And just think of uh, the disappearance of, of all this capital, and it's very important. But that, that is it. Yeah, low interest rates cause businessmen to do the wrong thing. They overinvest and they malinvest, make a lot of mistakes. Then the market dictates a correction, and then everybody hesitates to allow the correction. But the correction is locked in place. The most important thing we can do is to allow the correction to happen, let the bankruptcies come, let the prices come down, and what's, what's so terrible about a nice house going down in value? Somebody who maybe was frugal enough to save his money, he might get a real good deal, and those houses have to get in the hands of stronger holders. Mm, well, now there are some who are saying that this is just the beginning, that when you really start peeling the onion and you look at all the bad debt held by American citizens, businesses, municipalities, and states, and all these different things across the country, that really we're due for a major unraveling here, that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think, I think that's a good possibility, and it's worldwide, too. Uh, I, I believe it's, uh, we're facing something that we've never faced in history before, because there's generally been... You know, a few sound currencies around. No sound currencies for 35 years. It's the paper, a paperback world uh, monetary system. We have had the advantage of that, and uh, the other currencies are based on the dollar too because they have the dollars in reserve. So I, I think it's worldwide, and uh, it, uh, I think we're only seeing the beginning of this coming uh, apart. But by not allowing the correction, uh, we're destined to make this much more severe and last much longer. And this is a tough sell. Uh, I compare this to talking with a drug addict. You know, and you tell the drug addict, look, you don't need this anymore. And uh, then he says, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to feel very good. So he gets another fix. He feels pretty good. He feels better. But you keep doing that, you kill the patient. But if you take, if you put up with the withdrawal symptoms and do and do what you're supposed to do, you can save the patient and you can feel a lot better. And right now we're addicted to easy money and, and big government spending and all these bailouts. So uh, it, it's not easy politically to argue the case for tighten your belt and suffer the consequences when you think maybe next week, you know, on Sunday night we passed a $700 billion package. Next week the stock market might go up a 1,000 points, and then later on it's going to go down, something like that. But the short-term fix is what they want, and that's what politicians will generally always do. Yeah, well, it's strange timing, too, because they want a short-term fix, but I don't think they want it this close to the election, that short-term, because we're going to still remember their names, the people who went yeah. this thing. Yeah, I, I think that's the case, and what I think is happening is uh, they've had a lot of control, they've lot of, had a lot of profits, they probably know pretty much what we know, but I think they're arrogant and believe they can always contain it and take care of it. 
I remember another debate I had with Greenspan when I challenged him about, uh, you know, the balance of payments and how gold was important. He says, well, he says, yeah, I used to believe that, but uh, we as central bankers have learned how to get paper money to act as if it's gold, so, you know, gold itself. So he was sort of a bit pompous in saying that, uh, yeah, that, that's true, but uh, a well-managed fiat currency by us smart central bankers, uh, we can make it work. And I think I think a lot of them believe that, but I'm convinced that they can't make it work. I mean, you can't you can't make a wristwatch out of paper. So I don't think the paper standard is going to work. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I expect his new book titled Mea Culpa to come out real soon here. So let me ask you then. You talked about during your presidential campaign, Dr. Paul, about if you were president, what you would like to do is have the Congress legalize competing currencies so that, I guess, banks could issue their own money backed by commodities such as gold and silver. How does that work? Or well, how would it work? that's it. You, what you have to do is get rid of the legal tender laws that prohibit us from doing it, and only the Federal Reserve note is the technical legal tender. And if uh, we could legalize the circulation of gold and silver, preferably really uh, one metal would be better. But if you had two metals, there shouldn't be no fixed uh, ratio. But let's say you had gold circulate parallel to the dollar. We're, we're very accustomed to this because worldwide you have dozens and dozens of parallel currencies that are fluctuating from minute to minute. So we, we could handle that, especially in the electronic age, and to adjust. And people who opted for getting paid in a gold standard and, and buying in gold and saving in gold, uh, they could do it. For instance, if if somebody had been on a strict gold standard in these last 10 years, the price of uh, their gasoline would not have moved. It would be, you know, essentially the same. I, I argue this because, you know, the system we have today is, is very, very complex. I don't think it would be wise to purposely turn it off in one day, even though, if you have runaway inflation, it is going to get turned off in one day, so we'll like to avoid that. But uh, this way you could, you know, introduce it to people, and then they could make their decision. And if they thought they'd rather get paid in gold, uh, then they could do it. And then that standard, I think, would gradually just absorb the paper money. Well, back in, I think, 1981, uh, you were on, or I guess, got created, the Gold Commission, and wrote its minority report. Is there any chance that perhaps uh, this would create enough new interest that you could create another Gold Commission, and maybe your minority report could serve as the majority report this time? <laughs> well, that thought crossed my mind. They're not quite ready to have the – they're not serious up here about having a monetary conference, and uh, they're not going to admit that this system is done in. They're trying to salvage it. But we really ought to start thinking about that and laying the groundwork, which is generally what I think I do all the time, laying the groundwork for the day when it comes that we have more people interested than, than ever before. But just a few minutes ago, I had somebody come up to me on the house floor, and they brought me an article that was on the Internet, and somebody had it on the Internet, and they said, you know what, if John McCain would do this, he'd win the election cold. It was a pure Austrian economic article, the one that I put in on CNN, and uh, she was just bragging about this and thought it was wonderful. So we are changing minds, but they're not quite ready to have that key conference to have monetary reform. All right. Well, uh, we'll wait. We'll see what happens. Just keep teaching them as well as you're doing, and, and we can't do anything but better, I think, from here. Okay, Scott. All right. Thank you very much for your time today, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, folks. That's Dr. Ron Paul. He represents District 14 in South Texas. He's the author of Pillars of Prosperity, Freedom Under Siege, The Case for Gold, Gold, Peace, and Prosperity, Mises, and Austrian Economics, A Personal View, which I highly recommend. That's such an interesting read. A Foreign Policy of Freedom, which, man, oh, man, it's just a collection of speeches from the 70s all the way through today and just nothing but right the entire time. The best. And you'll learn so much reading that book. And, and of course, uh, my favorite, The Freedom Manifesto. His website is campaignforliberty.com, and we'll be right back with Robert Higgs after this. So why doesn't why doesn't the class, why doesn't the recession happen in a couple of weeks or a month or so? Well, the reason it doesn't happen in a couple of weeks, you don't have a quick boom, a quick recession almost before you can see it, is because the banking system, in order to validate the process, keeps inflating. It's not a one-shot proposition. In order to keep price flow and the other companies afloat, they have to continue to increase the money supply, continue to inflate. So it's allowed, for example, price to buy more, finance their inventory more as prices keep going up. 
They then have to get more bank credit to keep the thing going. It's like staying one step ahead of, if you're a heroin addict, let's say, increasing the dosage to stay one step ahead of, uh, step ahead of retribution. One step ahead of total collapse by getting a larger dose as they, to keep the whole, whole uh, inflationary boom afloat. Uh, 